All right, we have been in, go ahead and open your Bible, 2 Thessalonians and Daniel 7, three places. It might take you a minute to find a couple of these. So 2 Thessalonians 2, Daniel 7, Revelation 13. So we are in a study as a church last several weeks on the last days, talking about the last days and... Um, it's, it's, it's been fun for me. I, I love studying these things, and so uh, I don't teach on it a whole lot, but I love studying about it, and so it's been fun for me to prepare. Um, I, I don't pretend to be an expert, uh, and so some of you here, you're going to hear me teach some things and say, well, I don't think he's right, and you might be right. I think I'm right, or I wouldn't teach it, but uh, you, you, you might be right. The, the, some of the things we're going to talk about, they're not salvation issues. They're Bible scholars, people that love the Lord, and, and you can have two people that both know their Bibles can see these things completely differently. Um, and I, as a, I'm just a student, and, um, and this is how I see it. So uh, if I'm wrong, then, then we can all laugh about it in heaven and say, well, you missed that. And, uh, but at least I tried, right? At least uh, I'll, I'll be part of the group that, that tried to uh, preach on the end times. Um, first week, we talked about the rapture of the church. Then we talked about Israel in the last days. And then uh, last week, we talked about where is America in the last days. So all these things lead up to what I'm preaching on today, which is the rise of the Antichrist. And so um, those other messages were kind of foundational for what I'm teaching today. I obviously can't go back and teach all those three things. So if you missed those, you can go online, you can watch those messages. Um, but it, they are kind of foundational to what we uh, are looking at today. Um, so the, the question is, who is the Antichrist? Who is the Antichrist? Well, um, I don't believe anybody knows the answer to that. I don't think personally that the, the identity of the Antichrist will be revealed until after the rapture of the church. And so um, that's my personal opinion based on the scriptures, the way that I understand them, that we'll look at here in just a moment. So um, the world won't know who he is until the church is taken out of the way. Um, he, he, that's why the, the message on the rapture is kind of important that we did. Um, I don't believe he could come on the scene until Israel was a nation again. And so you need to listen to that message if, or maybe look at your notes again on that. The Israel needed to be a nation for him to come on the scene. We'll look at that. And then I, I personally believe that America would have to lose its place, its power, in order for a world ruler. He's, the, the whole world is going to come to him. There's going to be a one-world government, a one-world financial system, a one-world religion. And for those things to happen, um, America couldn't be what it is today. We would, we would stand in the way of that. And so you can watch my message from last week to see what happens to America. Um, you know, only one of those three things happened that I just mentioned. We, I mentioned the rapture, I mentioned America, and I mentioned Israel. Of those three things, the only one that's taken place is Israel became a nation again in 1948. So when that happened, that kind of a lot of people's eyes were opened and they started looking at where are we, what's going on that's significant as we talked about. So who is the Antichrist? Well, if you were a Christian in the early church, let's say you were one of the original 12 uh, apostles and, and um, lived in that time period and, and after Jesus was uh, uh, crucified and resurrected and here they are building the church in the book of Acts, if you lived during that time and the Roman government was was in control and in power and dominating the world and then started, just like they crucified Jesus on a cross, started crucifying and, and hunting down Christians and having them put to death. There was a guy named Nero who actually took Christians, who was in charge of Rome at the time, and he would take Christians and he would put them on a pole and burn them, just put them, use them as torches in his garden. So if you lived in that time, you'd be like, this guy might be the Antichrist. You know, if you lived in that season, if you were alive during the 30s and 40s of this century, of the 1930s and 40s, and Adolf Hitler would have been on the rise. 
And if you lived in that season, you would be thinking, my goodness, he might just be the Antichrist. They might have been wrong on that whole rapture thing. This guy is it's incredible. In fact, I was reading um, Chuck Colson recorded this in one of his books. He said, solemn, if you can picture this scene, solemn symphonic music began the setup. The music then stopped and a hush prevailed. And a patriotic anthem began from the back. And from the back, walking slowly down the wide central aisle, strutted Hitler. Finally, the Fuhrer himself rises to speak, beginning in a low velvet voice, making the audience unconsciously lean forward to hear. He speaks his love for Germany. And gradually, his pitch increases until he reaches a screaming crescendo. But his audience doesn't think that his rasping shouts excessive. They are screaming with him. He would go on to deceive the people, totally believing what he said. Lead them to exterminate the Jews. And uh, was it six million Jews, I believe, during that time? Through uh, mass shootings, through gas chambers. I mean, how many know if you were alive during that time, you'd think if he's not the Antichrist, then, then who is? Um, but the Bible says that no one knows um, when Jesus is coming. Y'all know that, right? We talked about that when we talked about the rapture. No one knows when Jesus is coming, not even the angels. So if, 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 if nobody knows, the angels don't know. How about this? Satan does know either. So some scholars believe that every generation that Satan has somebody he's preparing to be the Antichrist. So in the first century, maybe it was Nero. In the, in the 1900s, maybe it was Hitler. Um, maybe he has someone that he's preparing now. I mean, think about it. The Antichrist may be alive today. We don't, we don't know. It depends. If the rapture is going to happen soon, then I believe he's on the earth today. John says it this way. The same John who wrote the book of John and the, the book of Revelation also wrote three little books, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And actually, this is where the word Antichrist comes from. It's the only place in the Bible is, is in John's writing. And uh, 1 John 2, 18, notice what John, and he's writing to Christians. He says this, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. So what he says is, is, look, there is the Antichrist. That's who we're going to talk about today. But he also lets us know that, look, there's many Antichrists. Because Antichrist, the word Antichrist, it simply means, um, the word anti can mean two things in the Greek. It can mean against. He's against Christ. The other word can mean instead of. So he's instead of Christ. And so, um, so, so, to put it simply, the Antichrist will be against all things Jesus, all things Christ. If Jesus is for it, the Antichrist is against it. And so when you think about it, it's, it uh, d- does, is the Bible God's word? Does Jesus love it? Do we love it as Christians? Do we love the word of God? Well, if we love it, Jesus loves it, God loves it, then the Antichrist is against it. Uh, does Jesus love his church? Yeah, it's the bride of Christ. He, he, he said, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it, but will he try? Yeah, he hates the church. Um, does, does God love the Jewish people? Yes, the Antichrist hates the Jewish people and will seek to destroy them. So whatever God loves, whatever God is for, he is against. But also the word means instead of. When the Antichrist comes on the scene, He will show up as a Messiah-like figure, and he will present himself as the Messiah, as the one who's going to come and fix everything, and and the world's going to need a lot of fixing. If if we're right and the the Antichrist comes on the scene after the rapture, I mean, we got enough problems now. We got a lot of problems now, right, in the world. Imagine the problems after the rapture of the church. You take all the Christians out, you take... You know, how millions of people all of a sudden gone. You, you think of the financial crisis that would cause. You think of the chaos that would cause. You think of the fact of all the evil that is now let loose. 
Somebody needs to come on the scene that can fix all that. And that's what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to come in and he'll, he, he will be the, the fix-it man that will come in and people will look to him as a Messiah-like figure. Um, as I said a minute ago, John is the only one who uses the word Antichrist. Um, but there's about 100 references to him in your Bible. Um, Book of Daniel, we'll, we'll see Revelation, 2 Thessalonians, 1 John, different places. Um, and there's about 25 other names that he goes by. So I'm, I'm just going to give you a few. I can't give you all of them. But um, he, he's known as the fierce king. He's known as the master of intrigue. He's the, he's the prince who is to come. He's known as the despicable man, the one who brings destruction. He's the lawless one. We'll look at that. He's the beast in Revelation 13. And he's also, this one's not up there, but he's the son of perdition. Um, the Bible only uses that phrase one other time, the son of perdition, and it refers to Judas. If you think about Judas in the Bible, the Bible says that, that right before Jesus went to the cross that Satan entered Judas. And he becomes the son of perdition and, and turns Jesus over and uh, turns on Jesus at the end. And so just as Satan, the Bible says, the only person that says this in the Bible, that Satan entered Judas... The same way Satan will enter the Antichrist. He, 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 will, he will possess this, this person. Um, and so, so who is it? No, nobody knows. And then remember this. When, think about this with Judas. Um, at the Last Supper, Jesus said, one of you guys is going to betray me. And the 12 were looking at each other and thinking, who is it? They even wondered if it was themselves. They're like, hey, Jesus says, there's one of you that's going to betray. None of them all looked and said, well, obviously it's Judas. He, Judas wasn't Judas that you think of until that night. Up until then, he looked like everybody else. He fit in with the other 12. And that's the way the Antichrist were going to be. He's, he's going to rise to power very quickly, but until then, he's just going to look like everybody else. And because of that, he's going to be able to deceive the whole world. Maybe he's on the earth today. Listen, when you Google, maybe some of you all have already done this because, well, if Pastor Troy doesn't know who the Antichrist is, maybe Google will know. So go ahead and give it a shot. You know, Google, who is the Antichrist? And, and you know what? You're going to get about 15 million hits. And everybody's got an opinion. And um, again, I, like I told you on the rapture, nobody, nobody knows. Um, but there are certainly a lot of signs that point to the, that the stage is being set for the coming Antichrist. And when that happens, I believe that just means we should lift up our eyes because our redemption draws nigh. That we're not looking for the Antichrist, we're looking for Jesus Christ. Right, everybody? And so that's where our eyes are. So, um, so go ahead and turn to 2 Thessalonians. Um, and so Paul, just to give you a little bit of context, Paul is writing to this church for the second time. We have his first letter, 1 Thessalonians. And in 1 Thessalonians, he talked about the rapture. In fact, he talked about the rapture a lot. Every chapter, he talks about the, the coming of the Lord. <clears throat> and he distinguishes between the rapture and the second coming. So the, the rapture is when Jesus comes for his church caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The second coming is at the end of the tribulation when Jesus comes back with his church to rule and to reign on the earth. All right? I don't have time to preach all that again, but that's, we, we, we looked at that a few weeks ago. So in 1 Thessalonians, Paul is talking about all that. Well, after Paul leaves them, he's taught them all of this. Then it says that in 2 Thessalonians, he says that some people came in and basically said, uh, no, what Paul said, he didn't really mean that. He means this. And, and uh, you know, Paul or Paul changed his mind. We don't really know what happened. But there were some people coming in, and they had confused the church. And, and the church was going through so much persecution that the church thought they were in the tribulation. And so there's a difference, everybody, between tribulation of what the world does to us 
what Satan does to us, and the great tribulation, which is when God pours out his wrath on the earth. All right? You may go through tribulation. There's Christians today in other countries being put to death for their faith. If you were them and you were watching your children be put to death or your wife be put to death, you might think, my goodness, we're in the great tribulation. Well, here we are in America and like everything's good. So what I'm saying is that people all around the world suffer tribulation in person because there's a real devil and this is a, a, a broken world. But that's not the great tribulation. Well, someone had come in and told them that because they were going through hard times, Paul was wrong, and they're going through the great tribulation. And so Paul writes them a second letter. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. He said, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become uneasily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by a word of mouth or by letter. In other words, you know, people might be saying, thus saith the Lord this, and they're like, we didn't say that. And so you, you stick with what we said. Um, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. He talked about two things. He talks about the coming of Jesus and the day of the Lord. The coming of Jesus is the rapture of the church. The day of the Lord is judgment. Okay, I don't have time to teach that, but that's, that's clearly what, what he's saying. And so, and he says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come, talking about that day, the, the tribulation, the, the judgment of God, won't come until the rebellion, or your Bible may say falling away. That word is apostasy. In other words, toward the end of times, before the tribulation, there's going to be a great falling away that people are going to fall away from the teaching of Scripture, all right? That they're going to deny the, the um, infallibility of God's Word. There, there's, going, they're going to, there's going to be a, a drift from what God says in the Bible. There's a great apostasy. I would argue that we're seeing that now, that there's a great falling away in the church of people who still call themselves Christians, but they're falling away from the Word of God. I, I think that's happening now. And so Paul says, we're not going to see the tribulation until that happens first. So maybe, maybe that's happening. He said, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. That's the Antichrist. And so he says that the tribulation won't start until the Antichrist comes on the scene. That's what he says there. He says, the man doomed to destruction. Now notice his characteristics. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? What does that tell me? That when Paul was on the earth, he was preaching about the Antichrist. So he knew a whole lot more about him than I did. Because there's a whole lot more he told them than what we have in these letters. And <clears throat> I've just got some scraps and I'm trying to put it together. But obviously he talked about it when he was with them. He says, and now you know what is holding him back, who? The Antichrist, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. So there's a time that God has on his calendar that, all right, this is when the tribulation starts. This is when the Antichrist is going to come on the scene. Nobody knows but God. But notice what he says, but the secret, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. I believe, many Bible scholars believe that when he says the one who's holding back, the Antichrist who's holding back all this evil is the Holy Spirit in the church. That he's the one. And so you take, where's the Holy Spirit now? He lives inside of you. He lives inside of you. He lives inside of me. Millions of Christians around the world. You take us out and think of the evil that's now unleashed. Is the Holy Spirit still on the earth? Absolutely. He's still here. But we are gone. And so now all the things that the enemy has wanted to do, that the church has restrained him from doing, um, he can now do. Um, and then... And then the lawless one will be revealed. That's why I believe the rapture will happen, and then quickly after that, the Antichrist will come on the scene. 
whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow. Notice this, how easy Jesus, when the time has come, once God allows this all to finish, God has a plan even in all this. He, God hasn't lost control. He's going to use it for his glory. He's going to use it for his purpose. And it says when, when, when that time comes, uh, the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the bl- splendor of his coming. Well, let me know he's no match for Jesus. Jesus just speaks the word, is done, battle's over. You know, the Bible says Jesus is going to come back on a, on a white horse and the armies of heaven, we're going to be coming back with him and, and all this. And, and it's like we're going to do something. Jesus is just going to be like, and it's over. It's, and then we're going to be like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about right there. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> you ain't so bad, right? We're going to be thinking we're something, yeah, but it's all Jesus. Um, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. <clears throat> He'll use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. Watch this. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and work. Um, so, so, so first of all, we learn about the Antichrist. One of his attributes is he's the lawless one. Write that down. He, he's the lawless one. That's his characteristic. And, and Paul tells them, look, the secret power of lawlessness is already out there. The Antichrist is, the spirit of Antichrist is already in the earth today because Satan's already in the earth today. But there's a day when the lawless one will be revealed. And the lawless one, verse 9, will be in accordance with how Satan works. So he's the lawless one. What does that mean? Number one, he's going to come against God's word. He, he will come against, God's word is God's law, it's, it's, it's God's instructions, it's, it's the word of God, is the law of God. And he's going to come against the word of God. Uh, think about Satan, What's, as soon as God forms an earth and, and has people on it, Adam and Eve, Satan shows up. He shows up, not with a red suit and a pitchfork and, and, and horns and, or, or some ugly, beastly-looking thing. He shows up as the Bible says he was the most beautiful of all creation. He shows up, very beautiful. Now, we know he's turned into a, a serpent-like thing, but, and y'all are like, there ain't nothing beautiful about that. But before that, it was, he was beautiful. And, and the Bible says the first thing that he, he comes when he sees Adam and Eve or when he talks to Eve, actually, he says, did God really say that? All right, God, God gives them instructions and his, his, the way he comes in, immediately questioning God's word, did God really say? And that's what he's going to do. He's gonna, the Antichrist is going to show up and he's going to begin to question this book. And how many of you know most people don't know what the Bible says? He was able to deceive Eve because Eve hadn't heard directly from God. God spoke to Adam. Adam told Eve, and so he goes to Eve, and he says, did God really say? And she says, well, I think that's what God said. I mean, that's what Adam said God said, and there's a lot of people that don't have a firsthand. you got to know this book for yourself. Don't, don't base it on what I say because the enemy can come to you and say, well, does the Bible really say that? And you're thinking, well, Pastor Troy said that, but who's he? And he's a really good deceiver. So he's going to come against the Word of God. Um, And that spirit is already in our world today. When you you hear our culture attacking marriage as being between a man and a woman, listen, that is the spirit of Antichrist. It's against what God says, right? I mean, it's it's, it's not that we don't love everybody. It's just that spirit is different than what God said, okay? When, when we, our culture attacks the idea that there's more than two genders. This is new to me. But, you know, God said he made them male and female, male and female, he made them. So, young people, when you go to college and, or school and they start telling you there's 
now 24 or 32, whatever they've come up with, that is against, that's, 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 you don't tell your teacher that, but just in your mind, no, that's Antichrist spirit. That is coming against what God said. And look at the confusion and the, how many know God's not the author of confusion? He, he keeps it really simple. Um, when there's an attack on the unborn child, that's an antichrist spirit. I'm just saying that that is out to steal, to kill, to destroy. That's, that's not God. That's, that's another spirit. So remember, whatever God is for, Satan and the lawless one, the antichrist, is against. Look at verse 9. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. In other words, he's going to work just like Satan does. He'll use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. So here, here's the second thing I want you to say. Satan will give the Antichrist his power. That th this person is the embodiment of Satan. In fact, look at Revelation 13. Um, we're introduced to the Antichrist here. Uh, it, it talks about, it opens up talking about the dragon. If you read Revelation 12, it'll show you that the dragon is Satan. It says, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. And the beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and mouth like that of a lion. you got to read the book of Daniel to understand that he's talking about kingdoms, but he's talking about this leader that's going to come on the scene. He's using imagery. This was a vision. It doesn't mean the Antichrist is going to actually look like a leopard or a lion or all these things. It just, he's, those are things that describe his power. And it says, the dragon, who was Satan, gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. If you remember when Jesus was on the earth and Satan came to him and tempted him in the wilderness, he said, if you'll bow down to me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. So obviously he's got some power. He's got some authority. Well, Jesus denied that, but the Antichrist will be like, I'll take it. And Satan will possess this person. Everything that Satan is, the Antichrist will be. Another thing about Satan, Satan's a copycat. He's not, he has nothing original. So whatever God does, he tries to mimic that. He tries to copycat that. And so just like Jesus is God in the flesh, when Jesus was on earth, he said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Whatever, whatever the Father does, that's what I do. That's what the Antichrist will be like. He will be Satan in the flesh. In fact, he won't be Satan, but it'll be like he'll be a real person, but he'll be the embodiment of Satan. And and he will have extreme power that is given to him um, by Satan. So the Antichrist is going to have, write this down, he's going to have supernatural ability. It, it says that he's going to do, back in 2 Thessalonians, it says that he will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders to get people to believe the lie. So he's going to pull out all the stops. He's... He's capable, how I many you know Satan is capable of doing supernatural things? I won't ask for a show of hands, but maybe some of you used to be involved with uh, the occult or uh, satanic stuff, and um, the people that I talk to that have been involved that will just tell you, look, that stuff's real. There is a whole other supernatural world that you don't even know about, um, but there's a lot of power there. There's a whole lot of stuff, and... Um, and just as God is powerful, God is all-powerful, Satan is not all-powerful, but he does have more power than we do um, in the flesh, in, our, in the natural without God. And, and so he's going to pull out all the stops. There's going to be supernatural signs and wonders, displays of supernatural power. So, so listen, just, just a warning, church, as your pastor, just because you see a sign or a wonder or something supernatural, that doesn't necessarily mean it's of God. Because Satan can do some supernatural things too. All right, so that, that can't be the only thing. Well, it was supernatural, it must be God. No, it, it, it could be Satan deceiving. The Bible says he's going to come like an angel of light. He's going to do some of the same things. And so if you remember, Moses did signs before Pharaoh and then 
Pharaoh's magicians come up and they, they were able to do some of the same things. Like, how did they, I read the Bible today and I still don't know that. Uh, uh, Moses comes up, he turns the, the Nile River into blood. And then uh, Pharaoh's magicians come up and they do that too. I'm like, how's that possible? I don't know. There's something supernatural there. They, they, uh, Moses, like, all of a sudden made a bunch of frogs show up and then Pharaoh's magicians did the same thing. I mean, if I was Pharaoh, I'd be like, can you turn the river back to <laughs> enough of the blood? Can you turn it back to the, the, the other? Or how about the miracle of getting rid of the frogs? But, but anyway, I, I don't, it, it, that was funny in my mind. But anyway, it was, uh, <laughs> Satan is way more, but he's more powerful than any magicians. Um, and so the Antichrist is going to come. He disregards the word, and then he wins them over with signs and wonders. So listen, church, just again, that's why the Word of God is so important, because that's how we judge everything. We have to judge everything by the Word of God. I believe in signs and wonders. I believe that God still does supernatural things. I still believe that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. Um, everything has to be judged by the Bible. We don't just go by signs and wonders, right? All right, let's, let's, let's go. So the Antichrist, I, I was just thinking about a revival a few years back. Maybe it's been a while but that was going on, and um, a lot of signs and wonders were happening, and, and a friend of mine, a lot of healing was happening, and a friend of mine was desperately in need of, of a healing. His wife was, and they said, we're thinking about going down there, and uh, something about it just didn't set right with me, the, what was going on, and so I, I was reading about it, and I'm like, this guy's talking to angels and all kinds of stuff, and the things that the angels were telling him was against the Word of God, and, and I was like, well, look, you guys go if you want to. I mean, that's your prerogative, but I said, something's not right, and uh, they didn't go, and shortly after that, a guy was discredited, and a lot of stuff came out, but I'm just saying, the enemy's powerful, and he comes as an angel of light, and he'll rule through deception. Notice that he, he'll use signs and wonders to, Second Thessalonians 9, again, serve the lie, and all the ways that wickedness deceives. So Satan is a master deceiver, and he will lend his deception skills to the Antichrist. I want to show you just real quickly how good Satan is at deceiving. Are y'all okay? All right, all right. I know these messages, everybody thinks they want to hear end times messages, but it's, it's, let's go back to the Beatitudes. Let's talk about some love and mercy. <laughs> This is tough. All right, Revelation 12, 9. So the great dragon, talking about the devil, was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives what? The whole world. Revelation 12, 9. I may not have given him that one. He deceives the whole world when he was cast to the earth. The Bible says that even after the millennium, look, look at Revelation 20, verse 7. It says that after the thousand-year reign of Christ, that's another message another day, that Satan will be loosed for just a little bit of season, a little time. And he will go out and he will deceive the nations. He'll deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. Gather them for battle in the number they are like the sand on the seashore. He's good, everybody. He'll deceive a lot of people. Even, think about that. Even after a thousand years of Jesus, we can be deceived. Or we won't be deceived, but the people who live on the earth. All right, here, here's the next one. The Antichrist will be extremely charismatic. Again, people, people envision Satan like this cartoon figure or this really ugly monster-like person. I'm telling you, he, he'll be beautiful. And I believe the Antichrist is going to be this extremely charismatic, good-looking, very attractive. I think he'll be handsome. I think he'll be an excellent speaker. Um, Daniel 7 talks about the rise of the Antichrist, and he talks about all these beasts, you know, kind of like Revelation 13. He describes this beast, but then he talks about this little horn that rises up. And this little horn was going to rise up among the other horns. And he's going, to, he's going to rise to power. The Antichrist will be a political figure. He rises to power among them. And there in his horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. He's, 
In other words, the Antichrist, again, he's going to start out as this little horn. He, he, horn just means ruler. He's going to be insignificant. Nobody's going to recognize him. And almost overnight, he's going to rise to power. He's going to, everybody, the whole world's going to go after him. He's going to be so eloquent. He's going to be able to have all these, he's going to have wisdom to solve all the world's problems that people are like, why, how in the world? Well, the Satan has given him all this wisdom and all this power. And, and the whole world is just going to be, Amazed by this person. And almost overnight, he's going to rise to power. And you think, well, how can that happen? How can, how can someone rise to power so quickly that people just go after him? Um, I used to wonder that. And I remember maybe 20 years ago, I'm, I, I come home um, and uh, I, I ran home to get something. TV was on in the house. It was just running. Becky wasn't watching it. It was just on. And, and I'm going through, and Oprah is interviewing this, this young senator. Never seen him before, never heard of him. And, 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 I, and, I'll, and I'm just going through the house. I'm listening, and, and I'm thinking, this guy's sharp. I sit down, and I'm listening, and I'm like, this guy is one of the best communicators made so much sense. And, uh, and I remember just, just leaving that and think, I don't know who that guy is. Never heard of him before. Um, but that guy could, if he ran for president, people would vote for him. And, uh, within a year he was running for president. And next thing you know, he's filling coliseums with a message of hope and change. And nobody had ever heard of him a year before that. But then he goes on and becomes a president named Barack Obama. And there's nobody in this room that knew who Barack Obama was before 2004. Um, but you saw how quickly he rose and people were like, wow, this is, this is incredible. And so what, and I'm, all I'm, that's just an example of just showing how quickly someone can rise to power, can gain the confidence of the people, and the Antichrist is going to be so much better than any polit politician you've ever seen that's going to be more eloquent, more wisdom, and somehow pull everything together, he's going to be really, really good. He's also going to do what nobody's ever been able to do before. He's going to bring peace to the Middle East. For generations, people have been trying to figure this out. How are we going to bring peace to Israel and all those nations around there? And he's going to come in and he's going to sign a peace deal. Look at Revelation 9. We see the Antichrist. He's going to, verse 27, he's going to confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now a week, as we studied in the book of Daniel, is, is uh, seven years. So he's going to confirm a covenant with the nation of Israel and those surrounding nations. That's a seven-year deal, a seven-year peace deal. And within that deal, he's going to give them the, the ability to rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount, something nobody else is going to do. They're ready to do it. They've got the materials to do it. They're ready, but there's a, a, a problem with the other people involved. And somehow he's going to put a deal together on that. And when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's going to come talking peace. He's coming with peace, and, and it all sounds good, and... He'll get the Nobel Peace Prize. He's just no wars, just all peace. But the Bible says that three and a half years in, notice this, verse 27, Daniel 9, he'll confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he'll bring an end to sacrifice and offering. In other words, the temple will be rebuilt. They've got sacrifices and offerings again, and then he's going to walk in, and on the wing of abominations shall be the one who makes desolate, the abomination of desolation, even until the consummation which is determined is to be poured out on the desolate. What does that mean? That after all these years, Israel rebuilds their temple, they're glorifying God, and all of a sudden, this Antichrist that they've done a deal with is going to walk into God's, the, the, the Israel, the Jewish temple, rebuilt Jewish temple, and he's going to walk in and say, I'm your God. And those sac you don't sacrifice to him, you sacrifice to me, and the Jews are going to realize they did a deal with the devil. And God's going to show up and God's going to use it all to turn the Jewish nation back to him. But there is going to be a day that the Antichrist, he's going to rise as a political figure. But he's going to turn into this religious figure that, that demands to be worshipped. And if you don't worship, if you worship anybody else, you'll be put to death. Revelation 13. 
Again, it says, I saw this beast. Verse 2, the beast I saw resembled a leopard, but the feet of those of a bear, mouth like a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power. The devil gives the beast his power, his throne, and his authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been, had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. I don't have time to go into that. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. And people worshipped the dragon. They worshipped Satan because he'd given authority to the beast and they also worshipped the beast and asked who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? All right? So, who can wage war against the beast? He's always wanted worship. He wanted it in heaven. And that's why he got kicked out. And he's even willing to share it as long as he gets it. He, you know, listen, he doesn't care if you worship yourself just as long as you worship him too. Revelation 13 goes on and it says that um, the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words, the Antichrist, pr- proud words, blasphemies and, blasphemies, and he exercises his authority for 42 months, three and a half years. He'd opened up his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to wage war against God's holy people and conquer them. So now he turns, he begins to come after Jews and anybody who gives their life to Jesus during the tribulation. And it says, all, look at verse 8, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Look, everybody, there's so much more. I, we got to stop. Um, there, there's, right after this, there's the rise of the false prophet. There's, you'll see one, one world religion, one government, one currency, the mark of the beast, all those things. Um, but listen, here's, here's, here's the big question for us. Because I don't plan on being here when he comes, right? Do y'all? Anybody? So I, I plan on being gone. So what does that mean for us today? Number one thing is make sure you aren't anti- antichrist. Put, in other words, put your faith in Jesus Christ. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you don't have to worry about the antichrist. But just make sure that you're not against Christ. If you're not putting yourself in the place of Christ. Again, 1 John 2, 21 says this, I'm not written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it. In other words, John was writing to Christians, and he says, and and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. In other words, if you, if you, wanna, if you don't want to be in the category or worry about the antichrist, the, the way to do that is to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And that I, I'm going to surrender my life to him. And, and just as the Antichrist is a politician who's going to solve all the world's problems, can I tell you today, don't put your faith in a politician to solve all the world's problems. Put your faith in God. I'm not talking about you, but some Christians talk more about Trump than they do about Jesus. And can I tell you that personalities come and go. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but the name of Jesus will stand forever. So, um, so listen, let me ask you today, does Jesus have all your heart? Does he have all your worship? All those things that the Antichrist will force people to do, how many you know we do, not because God forces us, but because he did so much for me. I mean, he, he went to the cross for me. He took all my sin. He, when I was still a sinner, he gave his life for me. How much more should I not give him my life and all my worship? <laughs> Becky, you can come. So have you surrendered completely to Jesus? Here, here's the second thing, everybody. Look to the Bible for truth. Look to the Bible. Um, the Bible says that the coming of the lawless lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He's going to use signs, wonders to serve the lie. Verse 10 again, in all the ways that wickedness deceives. 
He goes on and says in verse 15, so then, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Whether by word of mouth or by letter. He, he says in verse 10, he says, the problem with that group of people is they refuse to love the truth. It's, why were they deceived? It's because they refused to love the truth. Can I encourage you today, maybe you've asked Jesus to save your life. Would you ask God to give you a love for his word? I remember being in my 20s and grew up in church. And if you looked at my Bible, I still have it today. I mean, the pages were crispy. The, it, I could have sold it on Amazon as new. I didn't crack my Bible. And I believed in God, I, I trusted Jesus, but can I tell you something? I could have been so easily deceived, and I was so many times, because I didn't know the Word of God. And so I remember praying when I was in my 20s, and I got a version I could understand, and, and, and I remember praying, said, God, would you please give me a heart, a love for this book? And God answered that prayer, and it just became... It, it just became just like, I just couldn't, I just loved reading the word of God. And I just want to encourage you that the only way to overcome deception is to know the truth. And I just encourage you to, to learn, fall in love with the word of God. And then stand firm on the truth. We just read, there's going to be a great falling away. People are going to cherry pick. Well, I like that verse, but I don't like that one. I love it when it talks about the love of God, but I don't like the judgment of God. I, I like it that Jesus forgives, but I don't like it that he asked me to turn from my sin and to, to stop doing those things. Well, it's the whole package, everybody. You can't just cherry pick the verses we like. We're going to, we got to devour the whole word and stand on God's word. Come on, it's no time for wimpy Christians, everybody. Here's the last one is depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. Second Thessalonians 2.16, he says, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us by his grace and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. May he encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. If we're, going to, if we're going to stand strong, listen, have you know we're going to need a lot of help. It's still going to take God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll, I'll close with this. Be Becky and I, Friday, our kids, two, two of our oldest were, were at the house, and uh, our daughter had just turned 29, and, and uh, we started young, everybody. We started having kids really young. And, um, and so they had the idea, let, let's pull out the old VHS tapes of like when they were babies. We hadn't watched them in I don't know when. So we had to find a VCR, hook it up to the TV. We pull these old tapes out and we're watching these tapes of when they're babies, when they're little and they're running around the house. And they're loving it. And both Becky and I had the same thought. We, we didn't say it that night, but the next day we got up and I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry that I wasn't a better husband, father, or whatever. We didn't know what we were doing. We had no idea what we were doing, and you could tell. She did way better than I did, but it was just like, I'm like, get off the couch, dude, and help her. I'm just, I'm watching the tape. I'm like, get up, man. I mean, I'm watching the ball game. My kid's over there running into the wall, you know, and, and I, I'm just like, and Becky's got the video camera, and she's like, uh, and I'm watching the video. I'm like, where am I? And then she turns, and there I am. I'm watching TV. And she's like, like hey, Troy, could you please help Victoria? Uh, she's stuck in the corner. And, and uh, and, and both of us, we just looked, and we were like, we're so thankful for God's grace. <laughs> because our, tur our kids turned out great, and we're like, that had to be God. That had to be the Holy Spirit. But just as he helped us, listen, he'll help you. Come on, stand to your feet right now. It's, um, how many know we need help? More of God's grace, more of his spirit. Let him strengthen you. If we're going to stand strong in these days, wherever we are in time, we're going to need more of the Holy Spirit.
And just as the Satan, ha- just as Satan has power, listen, God has more power. And the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of you and will give you power to stand in these last days. So listen, if you're here today, if you've never received Jesus, maybe you never even thought about surrendering your life to him. You've just been living for yourself, living for your family, just living for money or career or whatever. But today, you see, there is a day that there's going to be a choice between either Jesus Christ or Antichrist. There is no middle ground. If you want to surrender your life to him, then I encourage you to be the best decision you ever made to to surrender and ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. And so if you're here today and you just say, you know what, maybe, maybe you used to be serving him, maybe you got off track, whatever it is. Um, maybe you need a fresh start with God and you just say you know what I want to give a fresh surrender to Jesus today as my Lord as my Savior if that's you today would you just slip up your hand I'm not going to embarrass you I just want to pray for you if that's you would you just lift up your hand awesome 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 it's great it's awesome Father we thank you Lord you know everybody's heart And God, today, for those who surrender to you, maybe for the first time, God, we just say, Lord, here's my life. I give you my mess. And I just declare that you are the Lord of my life. I ask you to save me, change me, rescue me, make me your child, make me new. Come fill me with your spirit. And God, walk with me from this day forward. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Everybody said Amen. Amen. Listen, we've got a baptism in just a moment. And, uh, but before we do that, can we just give Jesus all of our praise one more time? As we work.